In a world full of distractions, there is one big question on every dog owner's lips. How do I become more than just the person holding the other end of the leash? We all get dogs with a dream in mind, a vision of the future. And if right now your everyday reality isn't quite that picture you had in mind, you are in the right place. It really doesn't have to be this way. You absolutely can and will be more to your dog than just the person who gets in between them and the world. The key is you need to be more sexy. More sexy than the neighbourhood cats. More sexy than the jogger in the park. More sexy than that half-eaten hamburger they just found on the floor. And yes, even more sexy than the dog across the road. I'm Tom. And I'm Lauren. Together, Together we're, we're Absolute dogs. dogs. And you're listening to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Welcome, welcome to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast, the podcast that gives you real life dog training results. And today I'm excited because I'm joined by a really good friend of ours and um, someone who's inspired me in huge ways uh, with uh, my beautiful dog, Brave. Uh, That is Sarah McKeegan. Uh, And we're talking about, I think, a topic that obviously is very dear to my heart and close to my um, last few years, really um, owning um, a a dog with with disabilities. And we are talking living with a dog with disabilities. So a huge welcome, Sarah. And Sarah, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself here, because although I absolutely feel I can do some justice, I feel that you telling your story and and how you've come into this and why this is for you an area of... um, extreme passion and emotion and 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 everything Uh, tell us a little bit about you and and why you do what you do uh absolutely and I just want to say thank you again for having me on and thank you everyone for listening it's kind of an unusual topic to be discussing but as you would know things happen things happen to our dogs and I am a actually a licensed physiotherapist and I went back to school and became a physiotherapist and then went on to become a canine rehab therapist and my journey with my own dog Sammy which I think we're going to get into a little bit is what really inspired me to create this this group called living with dogs with disabilities and it's really all of it together having been the clinical practice and working with dogs with different problems and injuries and things like that, but also having gone through it with my own dog in more than one capacity, because she had a number of different conditions. I really learned a lot about what it was like to actually live with a dog like this. And, and I chose the word living with a dog with disabilities very intentionally because it's not about managing your dog is still your dog. It's about living with your dog and your dog getting to be a dog. And It is an area of passion of mine because I think that it's often overlooked and when our dogs get hurt, we sometimes we just give them drugs, we medicate them, sometimes we have to let them go. And a lot of people just don't realize all the options that are out there for helping their dogs, especially around the mobility side of it. So that's kind of the reason why I focus a lot in my own practice on mobility and education and just empowering the dog parent. I say dog parent because I work with I would consider my clients to be dog parents. They go over the moon for their dogs. <laughs> but, you know, working with that population just to help them help their dogs be more mobile and stay active despite what's going on. So it's really a different population. It's not one I probably would have chosen at the beginning of my path, but here I am. And I think my own dog has had a lot of influence on me, on me getting here. I, I love that. Um, I love that um, Sammy has has brought you to places that maybe you would never have, have been in before. And, and Brave's the same for me. Um, Brave has, I didn't want to come on this journey. Like in so many ways, I fought it. And I emotionally, um, for those of you that don't know Brave, um, there is a, a, a video of, of Brave and our journey, which has taken me a long time to share. And it's actually part of my healing, I think, being able to share it and being able to speak about it. Because for such a long time, and you know, quite a long time ago, Sarah, when we first chatted, I, I don't think I could even speak about it. I was I was just so emotional, I couldn't even speak. Like I was so choked on it. And um, for me, Brave, her journey, like I said, we've, we've, we've documented some of it and we've popped it into um, our YouTube channel. So you can, you can check out if you're listening, uh, the Being Brave uh, video on our Absolute Dogs uh, YouTube. And for me, 
like I said, a journey I would never wish on anyone in so many ways. And I really hope that other people don't get to go through anything like this. And at the same time, I know realistically people do. And actually, some of the people that I have been most um, connected and um, appreciative of, someone scratching downstairs, <laughs> um, someone I've been most, um, most yeah, connected and appreciative and are people often that have really helped me in journeys like this. So people that have actually, um, or, or understood it, or um, other dog owners who have been through very similar, like that's sometimes the biggest connection. And I suppose one of my hopes for a conversation like this um, or one of my hopes for a um, for us is that we share it with people all over the world and that someone connects to this and someone can learn from this or someone can feel supported through this or someone feels they have someone to lean on through this or that someone else says me too me too and and I've been there and I understand and you are not alone and and there are things we can do about this and there are things that we can do to help. And, and I think that that's such a special reach out for, for dog owners. So whilst I, I think that what we're going to talk about isn't going to relate necessarily to everyone, I think there's definitely people that this should be shared to. And I definitely think there's people that will get huge learning from this. So for me, Sarah, tell us a little bit about Sammy and maybe her condition and um, maybe how that changed your path. Okay, so Sammy, she was a white German Shepherd. So she passed away actually right at um, the beginning of COVID. And um, I, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but I actually think that she planned it that way because first of all, she passed away on Friday, March 13th and we went into lockdown four days later. And I never would have forgiven myself if I had taken her into lockdown. Um, Sammy in her latter years had a condition called degenerative myelopathy, which is like ALS for people. And in those, those later stages, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, but in those later stages, she did have paralysis and, um, you know, with lockdown and everything there, I never would have been able to give her the goodbye that I gave her. So, um, it was a blessing, even though it really hurt at the same time. And, you know, prior to that, what really start, kind of started my path is I had always loved dogs. I had always loved animals. I used to compete with, I had a horse for 20 years, <laughs> used to compete. And then when I got Sammy, I mean, she was kind of destined for challenges. She was a white German Shepherd, as I said, and, you know, she was allergic to her stitches when she was spayed and she put a stick through her side when she was running through the woods when she was a puppy. She was very clumsy. <laughs> Uh, later in life, she also, um, you know, she did have some issues with her kidneys because of a food, basically a pet food type scandal, which is actually what put us on the fresh food path, which was something that ended up being extremely important to her longevity. Later in life, she tore her cruciates. And that's when I, right? And just for people listening, you're probably listening, thinking, this is horrible. Why did you do this to this dog? Sam lived a very full life and she was, I really do believe, and we have videos <laughs> that I'll share as well, but she was very, you know, happy, engaged. She lived a very full life and we learned a lot along this path, but she actually, through that rehab process, because we did surgery on one knee, the second knee, when the second knee went, because usually it does, did conservative management. And that's how I learned about canine rehab. And that's how she really influenced me to begin to push into that field and leave the field where I was, because I didn't realize that you could work with dogs in that capacity and not be a vet. Later in life, as time went on after the, um, this is, it's just going to sound really bad because after the cruciate tears, we did do stem cell, only it didn't go very well. There's a very low probability, but there is the risk of cancer when you do stem cell therapy. And she did end up with a spindle cell sarcoma on her side. I know, like, it's just, we were, you know, really lucky because it didn't, um, it was very slow. We had it removed once. It didn't affect her a whole lot. Although it's interesting because this condition called degenerative myelopathy that she had actually occurs. It's a, uh, a neurodegenerative disease like ALS, but it occurs in the, what's called the thoracic spine. So that middle part of your dog's back. Interestingly enough, that spindle cell sarcoma showed up on her ribs right 
around the area that we would expect to be first implicated by this disease. And I don't think that's coincidence. I think that's probably what set it off. So much learning. <laughs> um, but degenerative myelopathy is, again, a neurodegenerative condition that is, it's very slow. So it's not like what you experienced were brave where one day she was running and then suddenly she went down and it was this horrendous experience. It's more of like, you see things, you see your dog moving and you're like, it doesn't look right. Or they're, they're kind of wobbly, but they don't seem to have a whole lot of pain. They just don't seem to have a great body awareness. But it's like a and, gradual a gradual process rather than a yes, um, yeah. Like trauma. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So it's, we believe it's triggered by something. Some of it could relate to diet as well, other conditions in the spine, but it's slow. It's characteristically slow. And your dog kind of has this drunken sailor kind of walk that progressively gets worse that will eventually lead to rear paralysis. And then it, it basically moves forward in the spine. And again, it's the condition itself is not painful. It doesn't mean the dog can't have pain, but the condition's not painful. Um, but she taught me so much through that process because at that point in time, I had just, I was just starting this rehab journey. And I remember being on this, my first course, and you may have heard me tell this story before, I'm not sure, but I was on this rehab course. I had just been told by a vet that she probably had DM. So I was kind of taking that in. I didn't really know a lot about it. Wasn't fully understanding it other than she looked okay right now, but I was told that she was gonna get worse. And eventually, you know, it does lead to end of life. I was on this course and they brought in this dog. It was a rehab course and told us this, uh, it was a Rhodesian Ridgeback. She was really thin. She was in a blue uh, dog wheelchair. So she had like rear wheels and her feet up in the stirrups. And you could see the spine along her back, but you know, she was engaged. She was eating. She was taken in her world. Her parents were talking about her. I was sitting there watching and I was listening and then all of a sudden it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I literally got up in the middle of this course, walked across like a, an arena. I was in Ottawa, it, which is in Canada, <laughs> in the middle of the winter. And if you're familiar with anywhere in Canada in the middle of the winter, it's very cold. <laughs> it's snowing right now. I literally got up and I walked outside and I stood in the middle of the parking lot and I cried and I cried, I'm gonna cry now because I just realized what her future looked like. And I was like, I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna learn everything I can. I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna access as many people as I can. And she gave me that. And I think when she passed away between the caregiver role because you really do become a caregiver. Um, and that absence of being able to take care of her because she was gone and needing for, to fulfill that. And then also feeling like I needed to keep her legacy going to somehow share kind of like what you were go have been going through with Brave. Like you, you feel this need to, you're like, my dog didn't go through this for no reason. Like I owe it to my dog to share this message and to make this journey easier for other dog parents and dogs and make it so that they know they're not alone and they know that there's things that they can do. And like, what gifts can I bring through something like this? Like this, like, like you said, this will not go to waste. Like mm -hmm. this will not go to waste. And, and I don't want other people to ever, I'm a really strong person. Like I'm a really strong person. And yet it breaks me like it breaks me on a daily basis and and for me to feel so strong and yet so weak it's a really um I think to see the fragility of life when you are so used to so many good things and then to realize and and like you to have the wake-up call um I mean my wake-up call wasn't really brave actually it was my dad and Everest and this moment of realizing what the future may be and it's that moment of very similar when you said about that moment like for me that gives me like the hair on, on my neck kind of does that sort of goosebumpy feeling and 
it is that realization that the future wasn't quite what you planned it to be. And that might be your future. In fact, you might not even be a might, it's, it's likely to be, or the future of um, your dog or your family member or, or someone. And I think that whoever's listening to the podcast right now, it's possibly not our usual upbeat vibe and it's possibly not our usual like bouncy energy because I think there's a level of, um, yeah, check in a minute. And that doesn't mean that there's not great stuff out there and it doesn't mean that we're not grateful and it doesn't mean that we're not showing gratitude. It actually is a level of, um, it's leveling up, right? And it's leveling up with, there are all these amazing things to, to look towards and to be um, feeling great about. And at the same time, these things happen and how can we deal with them and how, who can we connect with and what's our community and who might we lean on for support? Because I know with Brave, you were one of the people that reached out and, and we chatted and, and that made me immediately feel like a breath of fresh air in a dark room, in a dark, cold space where you really don't know where to turn. Um, there were many people who were very, very generous over that time to me and you were definitely one of them. And um, I think that's what Sammy can bring and that's what Brave can bring and that's what we can bring um, through that, right? Because it can be a lonely place, right? Living with a dog with disability and it can be a place where you might feel uh, helpless or like you're not, you're not doing the right thing or it even raises ethical questions, possibly. 100%. And I think that that's, part of it and, and you've asked me before why I do this and and we've talked a little bit about this but the idea that um you know I think we can make better decisions when we're more informed mm-hmm, definitely um, and, and, and so empowered right we're empowered by by um that information I have to apologize Brave's actually got a bone downstairs and so if anyone on the podcast can hear a dog chewing a bone that is Brave and the reason Brave has to have a bone every time I do any recording right now is that she gets really excited and wants to join in and so she starts running around with a squeaky toy and that does not do her any good so she does have a bone downstairs so if anyone can hear her um I was trying to work out where to be because everyone was busy so I was here and Brave is just down in the um off the mezzanine so that is what you can hear but hopefully people get comfort and not feel bad about that she, she's enjoying herself <laughs> anyway um yeah. uh, the, the the community the connection the gratitude what we can share with other people like it's a massive deal right yeah and I even think about when you were talking like when we first started connecting and you really did I know I've said this before but you really did kind of open my eyes as well to you know that this really can happen to anyone things can happen to anyone and just because you know you you know you do it you're a dog trainer or you're a vet or whoever you are we still go through the same emotions and we still have a lot of the same questions and we don't have all the answers and you said this earlier but it's really hard when you feel like you should have all the answers and you should know what to do and you're suddenly faced with something and I think that you know something I've really learned as through this process and even working with my clients is, you know, don't have too much pride to ask for help because this is not a journey. When your dog is hurt, you have nothing to be ashamed of. This is not a journey you're ever supposed to be on alone. And I think that's the thing. If you're like, you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said this to me, you said to me, you don't have to make all of the decisions right now and you don't have to have the answers to all of the questions and you don't have to to be the person that um knows everything right now like when you're because I am someone who would always know exactly what I want to do in every situation and this one is just one that you've never been in before and and for those people who um have ever experienced anything like this you will know and for those that haven't I'm grateful you don't know and at the same time it's just a whole new position to put yourself in when you're used to being able to make very quick decisions or you you know the answers like I always feel like quite yeah I know the answers and then this one really throws you so living with a dog with a disability whatever disability that might be I was reading on a group this morning someone with a dog who'd had an FCE and who was now incontinent and they were trying to basically just stop all of the um, the fact that their dog was having accidents in their house and they were struggling and they didn't know how to tackle it. And, and those are the sorts of things that they do stress everyone's day out, including the dog, including um, the husband who doesn't expect the dog to live like this and the wife who's now upset because her baby is experiencing a completely different sort of um, lifestyle with them. And you read these things and you realise, well, you don't know the answers. Like, we haven't been there before. We don't know the answers. And yet sometimes the answers aren't that difficult 
and they're not, you know, one of the things that Sammy, I was thinking about the things that she taught me and a little bit, and I want to jump into the group for a moment, but acceptance and then the ability to be present. Once you kind of begin to accept where you're at with your dog, then you can be there with your dog versus trying to be somewhere else, get your dog back to where they were. And oh my gosh, they're peeing on the floor. And what do I do? And you know, something as simple as a belly band for male dogs, which literally is like a band that goes around and you can put like a maxi pad or I don't know what you call them in the UK, but you know, a pad in it to absorb some urine. It's, it's fine. Like you just literally wrap it around their waist and they don't pee on the floor. Yes, they still have incontinence, but so do a lot of people, <laughs> right? Like, but for some, somehow we make it a different deal. Like I, I think in the rehab world, so because I'm a physio trained in canine rehab, we take from the people world. And a lot of the things we don't make a big deal about in the, like the human side of life, we sometimes do with our dogs. When the solutions, you know, don't have to be really difficult. I mean, sometimes they are absolutely, but I mean, that's part of the reason why I created that group is something as simple as if your dog is older and has some arthritis and is beginning to slip in the floor, something as simple as putting down some yoga mats and getting a dog ramp can keep your dog mobile and engaged in their world a lot Another longer. One that, that we do, which I think is massive. Um, and, and I love that yoga mats. You just sent me some links for some toe grips that we are currently mm -hmm. measuring up for, for Brave. Um, that, so many things, but one of the ones that I really like that I've always done for my elderly dogs is I've never fed them in a bowl. And so because they never feed from a bowl, they're always moving. So they never get that like bowl collapse or that. Um, and, and I remember talking and, and this was a really, I remember talking to a lady who had my dog's brother and she said, he just kept collapsing over his dinner bowl and it made me so sad and, and he was put to sleep uh, at this date and I just couldn't stand seeing him his collapse and there were other things as well but his collapse was one of the things and I was thinking about it and I was like well my dog never collapsed but then I also never gave her a dog bowl because she always mooched around to get her food so there was always a level of enrichment in her feeding um, and I remember some days if we'd had a really busy training day she would be like mooching around the field afterwards and finding all the people's treats that they'd left. And I'd always be saying, throw out a handful for Poppy, like get a few extras, throw a few on the floor because she would love to do that after a good training day. She'd be out there mooching for the treats. So for me, when I consider little things that don't really, they're not a big deal and yet they are a big deal. Like they're a really big deal. And it's the um all of the different things that that can give a dog the enrichment it can give along for the mental health alongside the physical health like there are lots of little things and I think you raise a really good point there Sarah they don't need to be difficult things that we're doing for our dogs and when we're talking about living with a dog with a disability it could be as simple as an arthritis disability because actually that causes enough of a strain right absolutely and when you went through the beginning part of your journey with Brave did you did you use a lot of that you know the enrichment type stuff as part of what you were working absolutely with absolutely. absolutely and, so and just to just keep her like the things that I had never thought about before like I'd never thought about the fact that if we didn't turn her that she could get sores so mm -hmm. she could get like pressure sores or I didn't think about things like if she didn't keep mentally okay like balance then that could throw lots of other things like she could just go quite almost depressed looking so actually we did do lots of enrichment and activities and stimulation and um little games that she could do even though she was paralyzed because brave was initially completely paralyzed that you couldn't even she couldn't stand up unaided she never lost her she was she was never incontinent she was always completely she did she had i think one accident in six weeks eight weeks so she did really really well considering she went from a dog who could go out the front door to a dog who was living in a like in our bedroom and having a very different setup um but yeah i think enrichment in lots of different ways and um and realizing that actually um it absolutely is not just about um not just about what your 
doing um like each day from a physio point of view but actually what you're doing from how you're feeding and how you're um sort of stimulating with just being there and being around her so actually trying to sit with her but not in a way that sometimes I would I would take a work call but I would sit next to her to take the work call rather than leave her in the bedroom and me be upstairs I'd go and sit in the bedroom with her and take the work call so lots of different things um everything changed everything changed and I love your line tell everybody um what you say um because I shouldn't I won't say it for you uh, <laughs> because I, I couldn't get over that how different everything was and for a long time I thought it was over and, and that's just the thing is when you get this diagnosis whether you know it's a musculoskeletal injury or you know something like what you went through or something like what I went through where it's this long-term prognosis we go to this really dark place initially where we think it's done it's over I can't my dog can't do all these things anymore and really you know the motto of the, the Facebook group is it's not over, it's just different. And it's this whole idea that going back to this idea of acceptance and then what can I do? And I love this because you said this in your interview when we talked, but it's not what I can't do or what my dog can do, but what can I do to help my dog and what can my dog do and can we build on that? So it's really switching into this like mindset of like, you know, letting go of wh what's gone and then building from where we're at instead. It's just, it's yeah. So it's, true. Just it's so true. And it's also so hard because I, I think your body and brain take you back to what could and your photos and your video oh, yeah. memory. And you get angry about it. And, and that's, that's, you got to go through those stages of grief. That's part of the process, but it just doesn't, it doesn't mean your dog can't enjoy life. It doesn't mean your dog is not your dog anymore. Um, and, you know, one of the big things that I did when I started that group, it's different. I wanted it to be different from other groups because I started it around the time when, so pandemic, <laughs> everybody's in lockdown, people can't go to the vets with their dogs. Um, and a lot of people are just trying to figure things out on their own. And then there's a lot of, you know, being online, there's a lot of nonsense online too, and a lot of just struggle. And wanting to create something where people had access, they could learn in an entertaining kind of way and have access to those that don't typically, they would have access to and actually learn about all the things they could do to help their dogs be more mobile. Um, and, you know, learn a little bit about the rehab process and learn a little bit about mobility aids. So, you know, dog harnesses and booties and these belly bands and all of these things that, make your life easier they make your dog's life easier that, that's the biggest yeah. thing making things easier and also working alongside your program rather than working against it so for example one of the things the vet sent us home with was a sling but actually when you're trying to get a dog to go for a wee and you're slinging them up by their bladder it's not helpful and also, work well. <laughs> when you're, you're trying to go in close to them and you're trying to sling them that's not helpful either and so both you and a really good friend of mine who happens to be a vet physio as well, she said the same, get a help him up harness. And I ordered it within two days of Brave's injury. It was there within four days of Brave's injury. We were straight on that program. And that was amazing. Like it made such a big difference. I've still got them downstairs. And, um, and then when they did get really good, we just put the front one on and we got rid of the back one. It was like such a great, great, great piece of kit, like such a great piece of kit. And it was, it, it, those sorts of bits of kit are life-changing. Um, because they make a difference and um, simple as when we, we took Brave in the shower earlier and when we've got her in the shower to have like a sort of water treatment before we put her in her treadmill um, I say her treadmill because she really does dominate the treadmill these days so um, but when we're using the shower on her and um, we put a fit bone for her to sit under mm -hmm. she doesn't yeah. we don't expect her to stand for 10 minutes before she gets in the treadmill for 10 minutes we don't want her tired and fatigued before she's going in but little like hints tips tricks hacks that save your dog their their good energy or saves you a bit of heartache as you see them collapse or whatever it might be and and I think Sarah the thing we should maybe make clear to everyone is this could be someone's elderly dog with arthritis or young dog with arthritis or this could be a dog post um like a knee op, or this could be a dog um, who has done a cruciate, or this could be a dog like Brave who has 
a trauma, um, like a, an ANNP, which is Braves injury, which is um, a very, very instant, but very, very life-changing, um, an FCE, or it could be just like um, Sammy with her uh, DM. It, 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 this can come across everybody, right? Like it can hit everybody at some point. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I was thinking about, again, when we chatted before and the challenges that people have in the group is also, we can learn a lot from each other. Like, it's not just about, I bring in professionals, but I also bring in people to share their stories. I, you know, I have someone in there that runs a hospice and her dogs, it's amazing. She gets these dogs that are literally, she rescues them from rescues and they're on death's door and they're given like weeks to live and they live years in her care. And, you know, those stories so that people also realize, like you said before, it's so isolating sometimes when your dog is hurt that other people are going through this too. And some people uh, have found very clever ways of working through things. And, you know, even the peeing on the floor, like my, my friend Michelle actually calls it pee art. <laughs> so like actually making it not a big deal, like making it a little bit more entertaining so that it's not, you know, something that you don't want to tell people that it's, you know, to have fun with it. It's finding ways to lighten up, right? Like lighten up. And, and then also, I think one thing that might be worth raising is, and this has been massive for me, actually, um, having ways, if you are caring for a dog or a person or someone um, close to you um, that has any of this, or even, even yourself, finding ways to um look after yourself during it I think that's been really important for me like to realize that I do need some support sometimes actually taking it on alone is not that easy um and if you are alone finding a support network in it whether that's us whether that's a wider community whether that's like for me being able to go away for a couple of nights and actually not have to really think it too hard, like actually being able to lean on friends, family, and my team here, my mum, my dad, like whoever it might be, just to give you a little bit of um, respite effectively from, from because it because it can become um, emotionally taxing at times. And, and physically. I mean, did you find before you got your help him up harness that your body was starting to hurt a little bit? Like, were you bent over a lot over her? We were so lucky that we only had four days because we already got the harness so quickly. We're so we're, we're in such a good world. Like I feel like we were really unlucky and we were really lucky at the same time. We're really unlucky it happened and we're really lucky that we're in such a good place and we couldn't have a better center. Same thing like Braves injury happened right bang into lockdown. And if that had happened and we needed to go to like water therapies and um, get her to physiotherapists and stuff like that. But we didn't need it. We had it here and we had everyone remotely that could just hop on a Zoom with us. And we had people that said about harnesses and people like you who suggested things like we were really in a very lucky place. And that's why I suppose I want to share it now to a wider audience, because so many people are not in the fortunate position that both you and I are in, you having your physio understanding, me having um, just a wealth of people around me and, and a beautiful centre, which it's funny, you don't always know why you set up the centre. Like I always felt a little bit like it was a real luxury having the facilities we have. And then with Brave, I realised just why we needed those facilities. And yet I'd never really needed them before. I just sort of enjoyed them. Yeah. And then with Brave, I really needed them. I think that you know, that idea of, of needing other people. And we talked a little bit about that and, you know, bringing people into your circle and your circle of care. And I think COVID kind of made us more resourceful in a lot of ways in terms of like, and a little bit more in a position where, okay, I have to reach out. I'm not really comfortable doing this, but I need to reach out and yeah. seek out help. And I think that's really important for people to realize that things can happen and, you know, when you talk to your vet about it and things like that, and you do your, you know, you do your research, you do your work, but also to connect with others and to find people that have gone through the experience that might be able to even direct you to other people so that you get this in human practice, you never just go to your doctor, like you have a team, right? Yes. You yeah. need a team when you're working through stuff with your dog. A hundred percent. It's, it is about a team. Yeah. I think that's, you know, that that's a really big deal. But it, it, at the end of the day as well, it's just the team and the support and not feeling judged. Um, and knowing that you have options, like you, you, 
you can make better decisions that way. And sometimes it's a little bit, you probably felt very overwhelmed <laughs> and sometimes other people need to make the decisions, but to know that there's options for you and you, I'm still surprised and in, in, I've heard you say this as well, that a lot of people will lose their dogs when they've gone through something similar to Brave. And when I hear stories and people come to me with dogs with degenerative myelopathy and basically the advice they've been given is to book an appointment in six to eight, nine months to euthanize their dog. That's why I do what I do. Cause that's not right. Like that can't. <laughs> it's, it's not right. And I think that's, I mean, I remember having that decision to make because they said, this is where you are and this is kind of where it is and you kind of get to make that decision now and you look into their eyes and how do you make that decision like how do you make that decision as in there's no decision to make you're going to do the work right like for me you, you do the work but I can understand for someone who's feeling very alone isolated overwhelmed worried anxious um out of their depth like this is big so I've got a question for you and and, and this one is I think a really I think this was very very valid for a lot of people and it's a very quick one it's not a difficult one it's a very simple question one of the things that really I struggled with straight away was bringing brave home and not knowing like simple things I could do to improve my home like we've got slippy floors we've got other dogs we've got um open plan we've got um a big open massive space outside what simple things could people do to their home or to their space to enable them to feel a bit better bringing a dog into that environment once they've maybe had an injury or maybe they're gradually seeing their dog is becoming older more arthritic and um, they're seeing changes so what simple changes could we make to our homes that's a really great question and it i mean some of it depends on what's going on like in your case she had partial paralysis in her hind end which is a lot different than you know a dog that um, maybe had a cruciate tear or some severe arthritis, things along those lines. But even just some basics, um, creating a space for them. And like, again, the non-slippery, I can't emphasize this enough, but just having a non-slippery surface. If you see your dog struggling on your floors, like A, we want to know why they're struggling, but B, in the interim to put down some yoga mats, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but something non-slip to help them that way. Along that lines is also um, if you are feeding them bowls, like a raised bowl, you could always use, you know, depending on what you're feeding, puzzle bowls, other, you know, the little bowls that they can hold with their hands, <laughs> with their paws, if you're a raw feeder, things like that. So, you know, raising things up might be an option. Um, in Brave's case, again, making sure that they have easy access to water because dehydration actually can be a big deal with these guys um and bedding that would be another one that i think is actually really important is if you have a dog that's going to be down a fair bit having some type of memory foam type bedding or some type of orthopedic type bedding it doesn't have to be fancy you can get egg crate memory foam for them because you do they can get pressure sores and things like that so having something that like don't have those deep cushy beds have something that has a little bit more density to it that's going to disperse their weight um, can make a really big difference. Daylight, airflow, and something else, and we, ha we haven't talked about this before, but things like if you have, think of your dogs, like they're at the same level as little kids, right? A lot of them, depends on the breed, but you know, things like if you have like plug-in air fresheners and things like that, like those are not good for our dogs. So we want to kind of create a non-toxic space. So like, you know, getting rid of those types of things and just kind of generally keeping a space that's a little bit more clutter-free with some natural light, things like that. Interaction with others, a window if possible. I'm giving you a, a long list. <laughs> I actually have a checklist, but you know, they don't need to go in a dark room by themselves, right? Like that actually doesn't promote healing. Daylight, you know, a safe space. I usually, in most cases, recommend you block the stairs, if you, especially if you can't watch your dog. If you really want to keep an eye on your dog, you could get like a doggy cam. People do that all the time. And I think that's great because then it gives you a little bit, you're not constantly worrying because you can see kind of what's going on. But I mean, having, again, non-slip dog bed that they can get on, easy access to water. If there's an incontinence issue, you need to get 
pee pads, like, and keep your dog really clean. Like it's really, really important. Um, and to still be able to interact a bit with the family and things like that, but have the downtime they need to recover, but not to be isolated. I mean, those are, those are a lot of the big ones I would put in, keeping the space clear of other stuff. I think they are fantastic actually for dog owners, let alone for dog owners with a dog with disabilities like those. I'd love to take you into um, into our space because it's it's a lot of those things. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's all of those things. I'm very naughty. One thing I I, um, I must get better at is I love having like a wax warmer. So often there is a wax warmer in most of my rooms. I don't have like a an air warmer. like um like a candle sort oh. of but it's like a, it's on a it's on like a heat thingy so I do have those but I don't I need to check how I don't think they're highly I don't think I think they're fairly chemical free but I don't know so I'm going to check that even um, like cleaning agents like things that we use to clean our floors with yeah stuff like that like your dog's laying on the floor so on it I know it's definitely thinking on it and, and things like on the whole I'm pretty good at just having like essential oils I know are safe around dogs but um actually I should check even more I'm, I I should check even more than that but a lot of those things of I know with Brave very quickly we changed change for memory foam bedding um we I, and these a lot of these things were really instinctive I was shopping only the other day and I bought all raised bowls for everyone and I raised the water bowl so that all of the water the water bowls in a raise the other feed bowls are raised and we often feed off a step or we feed off something because I noticed it very quickly in the top line because Brave's top line would like hinge up she was on the floor eating whereas when she was on the top it wouldn't be perfect but it was it was less hinged um so raising was really good for brave or is really good for brave um, and then we really looked at diet when ever had um a cancer diagnosis so we massively changed diet she has um mushrooms she has all of our own AOK9 supplements plus she has um, mushrooms vitamins high dose vitamin c with calcium and and a couple of other um a lot of mushrooms I can tell you a lot of mushrooms and um, is Iscador is another one which is mistletoe extract and um lots of different um other cancer sort of um ca like the, the the things that they that a lot of the brilliant natural holistic vets have suggested and so Brett ever has all of those but alongside that we changed the food for raw organic where possible um adding great natural prebiotics probiotics um and also lots of uh, green uh fresh organic veg um never cooked um just always added to dinners and they're really good at eating it now uh, it took them a while uh, they didn't eat it at first but now they love it and uh they don't have like even we, we avoid things like carrot they don't get sugary veg um, and uh, they get uh, kefir, like whole grain, um, sort of natural um, kefir. Um, we, we really are like diet obsessed and uh, they get herbs from our garden. They get some herbal teas. They, they really are on the best. They are covering all the bases. They are living with coconut oil, turmeric, um, golden pastes. Like we really like to do all of those things. And so for us, and, and these are things that we then put our supplement mixes together, might put them in a Kong or a bone or something they can have and then give it that way or put it on a mat so they get it that way. Or we'll have lots of different ways we can deliver it. Um, but most of all, for me, these are all the awakenings that have come from owning a dog with a disability. So actually, I feel much more. I feel pretty empowered. I, I feel pretty expert at these things, whereas before I genuinely did not have a clue I would use a regular shop bought kibble um I would um definitely definitely not have considered half of the things I do and even better than that Sarah we then consider it for ourselves too right like some of us have just about had this wake up there's me I've got a great story actually I was eating and um, we'd had a, a Domino's pizza do not tell anyone uh, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, everyone's listening. I know you had dominoes over there. <laughs> My goodness, we have dominoes and the stuffed crust, and oh, it's a problem. And so, anyway, we're eating this dominoes. This is about two years ago. We were at a competition. And um, I turned around and one of the dogs was trying to like counter surf the pizza. And I was like, hey, you, what are you doing? Don't eat that. It's terrible for you. Don't eat that. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, God. I <laughs> like, oh, God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I think that sometimes, and I'm sure lots we of often different... feed our dogs better than we feed ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> lots of people will realize that actually maybe the wake up call is also that 
we treat our dogs sometimes better than we look after ourselves. And my dogs have regular physio, they have regular sort of massage, great feeding. But actually, I need to look after myself too, because ultimately, I am the carer of my dogs. And I'm my dog's parent. So you know what, without me, their life would look very different. And so actually, am I looking after myself as well? And that's when I started to look at my own supplements and my own diet and my own exercise, and my own, what am I doing? And I think that was all of this as horrible as I can't tell you now for one minute that I think having owning a dog with a disability um, is always a joy because actually it, it, it never makes me angry. It makes me sad. Like some days it makes me sad. And yet the blessings that it brings and the learning that it brings and the journey that it brings I'm also I'm glad I'm on that path as sad as it can be like there's a lot of learning right well I think that it will change you for the better and the people that you work with the humans that you work with and the dogs the perspective that you bring and the things that you see you see them from a different place um once you've gone through that journey and you have a different respect and I think it'll make you a better dog trainer without question absolutely yeah, I absolutely, absolutely do, for sure. And and I already see that. I already see well, that. healthier. <laughs> definitely healthier, and definitely you. I have way more input and advice to give other people, and I also see subtleties that I never would have seen before. I was really, really anti putting brain on brave on any pain meds, and recently, um, she wasn't herself. She just wasn't herself, and uh, she'd. I, I think what had happened, and we can only ever hallucinate, right? Because we're not in our dog's heads, um, even though we sometimes think we are, but we don't really know what they think. Uh, but for me, I knew she wasn't herself. And so I left it a good couple of weeks. And I think the reason it had happened is I think that her core was off and weak for, for whatever reason. And then she compensated by using her front. And then her front got sore. And then she basically started to look a bit lame. Um, and when you've only got three good legs, then you really can't lose your front leg because you're, you anyway, I don't quite know what happened, but Brave was off. And so I've really fought using pain meds on her at all. And I really didn't want to use pain meds because I felt like I was a failure in her by using them. I felt like this in some ways, like it was, it was me that had failed and that I was trying really hard to fight, not putting her on pain meds. And actually, if I'm honest, I probably should have put her on them earlier. And Why that, did you feel like that though? Like... I suppose, I suppose that I felt like maybe, I, I think possibly I won't take them myself. So I don't take pain meds really ever. I really don't. Um, I'd have to be, I just don't take them. And they don't always make me feel good. So then I'd maybe put that value on my dog. And actually, the more I observed Brave and the more I watched Brave, I could see that something was wrong. And actually, I did in conjunction with my vet and my physio, um, who's an in-person physio, um, we decided to trial a couple of things with Brave and we've got her on a couple of meds at the moment, morning and evening. I would like to wean them off at some point. Um, I suppose I see them as a sign of weakness or failure and I don't know why, that's definitely something I need to work through. Um, but she's so much happier and she's so much happier and she's so much more herself and she's so much more like her eyes are, the, are back to normal. She's doing all of her normal like funny things. Um, all of her normal um, happy play with a toy and look for look for interaction they're all back again and actually they'd gone a little and I think because pain can sort of creep up on you and then you only see it when it's sort of like a bang you don't always see the subtle things I spotted the subtle things but I ignored them and I kind of like gave reasons or excuses for them like oh it's been a bit windy and maybe it's a bit noisy and that's why she's not like that and that's why she's not enjoying this and and actually I think one thing that living with a dog with disabilities teaches you is to look for subtleties. Like you look for those little signs before they become the big thing, would you mm -hmm. say? A hundred percent. And there's kind of two things in there that I, a lot of people tell me they don't know when their dog is in pain or they, they can't tell. And, and, you know, I've had people come in to see me and their dog is limping or they're not using a leg and they're like, but I don't know if they really have pain. And it, it's, it's a, like, you, I think you nailed it when you said the acceptance part of it and you feel it kind of like you failed in some way that we've kind of made pain medication a bad thing. And I'm not a proponent of just medicating and not knowing why you're medicating and just medicating and doing nothing else. Cause I don't think that that's a bandaid type of approach, but I think learning what your dog's natural behavior is, and then being able to notice when there are changes that 
it's kind of like when your engine light, you know, starts to flash and sometimes it'll flash here and there before it goes on <laughs> and stays on. But it's, when you start to see things not sounding right or you're getting those warning signals, you need to do something, try to begin to figure out what's going on. But the other piece of it, like you said, like you saw these sort of changes in behavior. And then when you manage the pain, you get her personality back. And I think that we need to be able to use pain management in conjunction with other therapies and understand that a supplement's not a pharmaceutical. You shouldn't be just using pharmaceuticals randomly. You should be getting a professional advice on those. But especially if you have a dog that's like post-op, from a rehab point of view, you have to manage pain early. And then you, if you can give your dog medications early in conjunction with rehab, then you can get them off them faster. We can manage pain and it doesn't end up going from pain related to an injury to something that's more like chronic pain, which is much harder to manage. Yeah, and, and it's that that I think I would want everyone to know about. I think uh, my thoughts here would be work in conjunction with your vet. And if you don't yeah. get on with it, find another vet. Like, you know what, there are other good vets out there. And and I've changed my vets and um, I'm really I'm lucky. Somebody I, I, you can talk. So, someone that you trust. I, I mean, when I say I've changed my vet, um, my, my, my beloved vet died, which was really, really sad and um, really brilliant vet and died of, um, of cancer a good few years ago now. Um, and quite suddenly, so it was over like a three month period and, and then that was it. And, and she was so like my vet, like she was so my vet. She'd come in my house, she'd treat the dogs in the living room. We would do acupuncture over sort of her drinking um, a cup of tea and eating cake. It was like the nicest situation. And then uh, losing her was a really big thing for me. And I changed my vets and I had a few other vets there. And I just didn't feel I could, I didn't feel like we had a com connection or a communicate that I didn't want them to do this, this and this. And I needed them to do this, this and this. Even today, um, one of my dogs was at the vets with them, um, one of my staff, actually, the team here, because we were here and um, they, they, were, they were taking her. And uh, it was great. The, the, the person said, uh, the vet said, I'm going to just take them in the back and I'll give them this. And she said, no, no, you can do it right here in the vehicle with me. And I love that because our, we are quite we're quite um, determined in how we know our dogs need to be treated and and they, they treat them with us and we'll hold them and then it's not stretching for them. And um, anyway. And part of the process. Yeah. You and, should be part of the process. And you can set that up. And I, I would love to empower owners to know that you you get to cue that and you get to call that. Like I, I will only work with a vet that wants to work like that. And if they don't want to work like that, then there's other vets. And and for me, um, I do have that connection with my vet. I can ring her and I can say, look, I need this, this, and this. Brave's looking like this, this, and this. I absolutely want your input. My feeling is I would do this. What do you think? And I love that I can have that communication with her now, not let's just put her on, um, like one of the drugs that was in question was um, gabapentin three times a day. Actually, let's think about, could we do a combination of this and this? Would it be evening and morning? And this is something we could wean off. And if we do it like this, we can wean it off as soon as the pain looks better. And, and so I, I think that's really important, having that, that connection and that relationship with your vet. And, and please, if you don't have that relationship and connection with your vet, then let's get another vet. Like there are vets out there and there are vets out there. And, and for me, these are the vets that I think are treasured, special, um, valued. And um, yeah, I, I, th I think that's really important that we that we have that appreciation and that connection to be able to converse how we feel, because you are ultimately the person that is with the dog 24 seven. Your vet only sees them the two minutes, yeah. which may be like less than half a percent of their week right like it's such a small part of their their time and that's why you are your dog's advocate your dog's expert your dog's um i mean most vets are still like they're preaching um like the vet prescribed diet so i'm like no 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 like it what i'm saying is you've got to be able to have that that's a long conversation <laughs> we won't go down that route we won't go yeah. down that route. but i think i think for me I think this is really important that we acknowledge that you can be part of this process and you are the one that you, you are your dog's advocate, right? We call it client care, like client centered care. Like you should be your dog's advocate. You know, your dog best and then you should be comfortable. Like don't be afraid to ask questions. Absolutely. Be curious, ask questions. If you don't like the answer, ask more questions, get a second opinion. It's okay. You're allowed. Um, it's your dog at the end of the day. So I think that's really, you know, a really important point that 
there's options, there's always options and that you need to be your dog's advocate and that you should feel okay asking questions. You need to ask questions. I absolutely love that. And I think I have always been someone who asks questions. Um, I remember at school having it on a school report, Lauren asked many questions and then a few teachers who didn't like the questions. They, just, they didn't like being questioned, but I am someone who's always questioned. My background in law made it even worse because then I really want to interrogate question. And I've toned that down because I realized that people find that a little much sometimes but asking questions is healthy I have I have two questions Sarah for you and I'd like to join in with one of them but the other one I think um I'd love you to answer um and I'm I'm just so aware that oh my lord I, we could talk all day on this we really could we're blown um, way over. I know, I'm not timing this but I know we're way we, over the 30 minutes <laughs> We should just enjoy it, I feel now. We're just, we're just kind of rolling with it. Um, what is the most powerful lesson that you've learned from, and, and I'm going to give my answer and then I'd love you to give yours, but what's the most powerful lesson you've learned from the way you've seen dogs cope with disabilities? And I remember, I remember, I, and I've got this on the Being Brave video, that I am fighting the tears whilst I'm taking Brave for the first sort of trying to, walk or whatever we call it like going to the toilet break or and I am fighting just breaking down and I've got Liza with me and Matt with me and Liza is like absolutely heartbroken and um, we've only just got back brave back from the vets and um they've sort of sent us home very little information and here's your dog and she can no longer walk and um I remember I can't remember who was with me and they just said just look at how brave is though like look at her she's it's just like, it's okay. I've got three legs now. And one of them isn't so great of my three legs. So really I have two legs, but you know what? I'm still cool. Like, and she's, it's just the way they deal with it. Like for us as humans, we would have so many thought processes rushing through our heads and so many like judgments and, and emotional everything. Like there would be so much. And yet the way for me, I think the most powerful lesson I've learned with seeing how dogs cope with disabilities is their acceptance of it, their immediate acceptance of it. I think the immediate acceptance of the position they're in. They just do it with so much grace. Like so much grace. And kind of building on that, because I would 100% say that, you know, it, I actually said that recently to a client with a border collie, I was like, you know, his leg doesn't work. He'd be happy just to run around on three legs and he will just yeah. follow you anywhere until the, you know, the other leg falls off and then he'd figure out something else and he'd keep going. Cause it's just the way dogs are they They're in the moment. But the other piece of that is that they just figure out another way. Yeah. And we worry about all the other components of it, but they, they kind of are just like, okay this happened okay I'm gonna go do this now and oh okay I'm gonna just do it this way it's not the same way I did it before but I think it's just that acceptance and then figuring out another way I absolutely agree and I remember I left Brave once in my bedroom um, and I didn't do the pen up and she's got like a big big pen in our room she hasn't anymore she's moved out into the other room but at the time she did until a few weeks ago and anyway I left the pen open accidentally I came back in and she was sprawled out on my bed and I was like how on earth <laughs> how did you get up there you can't even walk like how did right, this right. And I, one part of me was like absolute panic like absolute worry and petrified that she's done some serious damage to herself and the other part of me just wanted to laugh and hug her for just attempting the massive like launch that is our bed like I, I cannot believe that she dragged herself up there and she must have dragged herself up there because she couldn't even stand unaided and yet there she was on on our bed sprawled out in the pink bedding having a lovely time um she just makes me like you gotta laugh right you gotta laugh <laughs> you gotta right. laugh my next question to you then is how do you adjust your expectations of getting the right balance between giving great care? Like for me, I'm there lasering, massaging, um, giving um, every treatment that I can possibly find, but still letting your dog be a, be a dog. Because I can tell you now, this is probably one of my biggest struggles. Um, giving all of the levels of input that we want to input, treadmilling and um, my fascial release and um, lots of different bits. And then on the flip side to that, um letting her be a dog how do you do that risk tolerance <laughs> um 
I mean, some of that, the professional answer, uh, we, can, we can kind of approach this from two ways. Professionally, we're looking at what is reasonable outcome? What do we expect the outcome to be? And we talked about this before, but that whole idea of normal, like that is a word that we probably shouldn't be using because it means so many different things and we need to be really careful about that. And then being able to have some measures of how the dog is doing because we're not necessarily going to make her you know you said the neurosurgeon told you and that was your aha moment that you know that she's not going to walk normally probably but that she is not a victim that she is a hero and that she is you know enjoying life and I think having that mind shift and I would actually literally write that you should I listen to your recording of that often <laughs> but you should really like write that somewhere you can see it as a reminder but also being able just to sort of measure where she's at. So you have some measurements. I mean, we use things like outcome measures, quality of life scales, functional independent scales, all of these things. Even writing down your dog's five favorite things. I love this and I get it, especially if you have an older dog or a dog that's going through something because you want your dog to be able to do most of the things on your five favorite things list, right? And they might look different than they did before going back to the, it's not over. It's just different. Like Sammy loved going to the dog park. She loved going to the beach. There was a point in time where she couldn't walk on her own. So we put her in the wheelchair and she went to the dog park in her wheelchair. And I used to run after her down the beach. I'd carry her over the rocks, get her in a cart. And people would literally laugh because she would run into the ocean in her cart. And she was just being a dog, having a good time. So it, she could still do her thing. She just did it in a different way. So, you know, can your dog still do the things they love to do? Are, is their pain managed? Are your goals, because we set goals, right? We, we do, you know, what do you want to do? What do I believe is the reasonable outcome? Let's talk about this. Let's measure some things and then we can check and see how we're doing as we go along. So sometimes, especially if, you're a high achiever, sometimes having those measurements <laughs> versus just some softer stuff is a good call to do. But, um, you know, that would definitely be a big part of just, you know, accepting where you're at and then making sure that, and I struggle with this too. I even struggle with this with my own dog now. Like, I'm like, I don't want her to get hit by a car or something like that. If she's running in the park and she chases a squirrel and runs into the parking lot, but to let them still do some of the things that they enjoy doing. And we can put in some safety parameters, whether it's, a you know, in Brave's case, maybe you're putting a little back brace on her, maybe she's got some booties. But, you know, when we talk about quality of life and then being able to do things that are instinctual to them, to still be able to let them do some of those things, I think is really, really important. So it's just being able to understand what's, you know, definitely not safe versus what is kind of low risk, even though it might make us a little bit nervous. And we do it in small bits. Like, you know, it doesn't mean like if she wants to play with another dog, you're not taking her out for half an hour or an hour. If she's never, if she hasn't played in a long time, you're taking her out for 10 minutes, right? So it's introducing things in those smaller, smaller I think you pieces. Raise, you raised such a good point because um, only recently um, we have like a really cool dog space, like a really nice dog room. And um, it means that we've got like a nice calm space that say you've got visitors coming in, the dogs don't have to be straight up front with, with everybody immediately. You can decide who you want, where you want, when. And um, Brave has not been in that sort of space for like since the accident really. And in the last six months, she's wanted to be. Yeah. And so for me, that's been quite hard because I've got to let go of like, what if someone knocks her or what if someone, and yet the dogs really adjust very well to each other and mm -hmm. they all adjust very well to Brave and Brave's adjusted very well to them. And she loves, like, we have her mum, we have her sister and we have a son and she loves family. Like Brave is a really um, sweet, sweet, sweet girl. And um, yeah, what you said is so true. I, I just had to do it slowly so at first she might be in there an hour and then she might be in there two hours and then she might be in there three hours and now she's in there all the time and it's really hard to get her to come back in my bedroom like she won't sleep in my bedroom now <laughs> them I do not sleep in your bedroom um and um, it's a really beautiful space but she's very very opinionated about that is where she is she doesn't want to be in my bedroom she doesn't want to be split apart from them she wants to be part of them so 
yeah I love that Sarah I really I like that almost a little bit like emptiness syndrome and that just came to me right now but you're if you That's play some caregiver role yeah. for such a while and then she doesn't really oh I don't need you as much anymore yeah, she really does <laughs> I'm like, I feel a bit like, where has she gone? Like, I feel like, mm. in, fact, in fact, I moved her, um, her pen out. And then the same day I moved um, my puppy, Nifty, I moved her crate into my room. So I, I just replaced it with one from the other. So I feel okay again. Um, Sarah, it's been, go on. Oh, I was just going to say related to that. And I was just thinking about this. Something to, you know, especially people raise the question around, you know, quality of life and ethics and things like that but it comes down to as well as if you're keeping your dog around then you know who are you doing it for are you doing it for them or for you and that's a harder one to swallow but sometimes it's that you know to let them even if there is an element of risk low but again to have them be able to be a dog and do some of those things like if they really love that that's what they dog want. They want to do. That's what it's about, isn't it? They live in the moment. They live in the moment, and I think that's probably a lovely point to round up on for everybody that's listening. Um, I think living in the moment um, and appreciating appreciating where you are right now, rather mm -hmm. than um, taking it back to where you wanted to be or where you hoped you'd be or where you were, or um, being able to be present. Are great teachers of being present. They just live in the moment. I, th I think, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think this has been incredibly yeah, healing, useful, powerful, great for people to uh, relate to. And I think it relates to not just people um, that are going through having a dog with disability. I think this relates to anyone who's giving care um, in any capacity, actually. And Thank you again for doing this and to be able to share your voice with your community and talk about these things because I think just the more we talk about this the better the more people learn the more people know and the more people realize they're not alone and their dog is still their dog and that for me is the message that um we uh, get to share so everybody that's listening that was this episode of the sex in a squirrel podcast it was a slightly different episode and I hope that you realize um, the change in energy isn't because not Sarah nor I are sad. It's actually that it's a, a topic that I think really deserves the right energy. And I feel that this is the right energy um, for what we're doing. And so most of all, everyone that's listening, um, thank you, um, obviously, Sarah, for joining us. Check out um, Sarah's uh, Dogs with Disabilities, um, Living with Dogs with Disabilities Facebook page and uh, watch the video of Sammy because she certainly um, is an incredible inspiration to all of us as is uh, Brave and um, I'd love you to watch uh, Being Brave on YouTube. Uh, we will be doing some super cool um, future topics with Sarah and uh, next week's podcast is epic. I want you to make sure you check in again and remember everybody, everybody out there listening, remember stay sexy literally you guys are um, incredible and i'll see you all next week Good girl. You're such a good girl. For the ball? Give me the ball.